All right, and welcome back to another episode of These Three Things. And today I'm talking with my relatively new but humbling good friend, Joe de Tavernier. Joe de Tavernier joining me today from the great state of Texas, but formerly from Belgium. And, uh, and Joe, one of the reasons I reached out to you is that you and I have something in, in common, and that is we are both contributing authors to a handbook, this incredible text written by Dr. Timothy Coombs. And what I, what I love about this is not just that I'm in it and that you're in it, but there's a bunch of people that have contributed chapters into this book in an effort to help connect uh, from academia and research to practice, and I and I love that about a, I love that about Dr. Coombs. He he was really like, it's all great that we have researchers and academics that that look into this space and they and they create, you know, theories and principles. But how does that actually connect to boots on the ground? Which is what I love about this book. Uh, check the link for how to find this book. You can find it on Amazon. The Handbook of Crisis Communications by Dr. Timothy Coombs and Dr. Sherry Holliday. Uh, great resource, not just because Joe and I are in it. So Joe, thanks for joining me today. How about, how about we just start with a little bit about you because you have quite the interesting um, career path and uh, choice of home path. So just a little bit about you, Joe, and, and what, you, what you do, what are you up to? Um. Well, I, I started my career in the Brussels market. That's now already, I'm getting to be an old man. That's already like 20 years ago. Learned the ropes in independent PR agencies on the Brussels market. Um, I have, um, and the ropes meaning public relations, corporate communications. Um, I am not an, I don't focus exclusively on crisis communications. I. An important part of my work is also B2B public relations. Uh, but since my very, since my start in, in, in the corporate comms consulting, um, crisis communications, media trainings have always been, um, and media trainings in view of crisis communications, that has always been part of, uh, part of the mix, helping uh, clients um, prepare for a crisis, uh, crisis manuals, training, role playing, desktop simulations—all those, all those good things. Um, about eight, eight years ago, I moved from Belgium to um, the great state of Texas, right? And have been living. So I've been living since in uh, in the San Antonio area. Yes. Yeah, the accent has not disappeared. <laughs> as you know, so you, I am a Dutch-speaking Belgian, so you're hearing a Dutch accent. I was too young to ever, I was, or I was too old moving to ever lose the accent, which is okay. Um, um, and uh, yes, I'm, I'm um, having a lot of fun um, and, and enjoying myself, um, helping counseling clients with corporate comms and asset, also other parts, other other PR assignments. What a great journey! Now I, I'm interested. I know how. I know how I was able to connect with Dr. Uh, Coombs. What's your, what's your connection to Timothy Coombs, who is arguably the current most relevant crisis communications researcher, professor, yes. academic, the the brain, if you will, of this as a as a space. What's your connection to to Tim yes. Coombs? We need to share the video with him. He'll he'll enjoy those remarks. Yes, <laughs> but um, about. 17, 18 years ago, I, I stopped counting. I uh, was a young consultant, a young man who picked up ongoing crisis communication. Uh, and reading the book, I um, I started connecting dots that I had not connected before. I discovered situational crisis communication theory. Um, you know, and then the, uh, uh, such a powerful model that lines out, you know, that lays out what communication options you have available to you, depending on your perceived mind, perceived, right, responsibility for a crisis, right? Um, and I also read in the book about, uh, you know, what the, the knowledge, the skills and the traits 
should be of people who are member of the crisis communications team. So, and other things, and other things, right? But this was also systematic, so thought out, so well presented, uh, that I thought the people I reported to in, in, a, in the local Brussels PR agency, look, we need to get Timothy Coombs over. Buy him a plane ticket and have him give a lecture here. Um, invite our clients, invite prospects, invite our network. We need to talk to this man. And he came, he came, right? And there you had it. You had uh, a room full of uh, PR directors and spokespeople of some of uh, major Belgian uh, public and private companies listening, discovering um, situational crisis communications theory. And I have maintained um, a connection with him since. Um, we share in common not only that we have contributed to his book, but also that we respect him very much for his contribution uh, to the field, um, to the academic field, but also in then building that bridge towards practitioners, because that's something that not all academics do, right? So um, you're a fan, I'm a fan. Um, um, so that's um, that. that is how this came about. I th I, I'm picking up on a theme with a lot of people I talk to. I'm a fan, you're a fan, they're a fan, we're all a fan, Dr. K Tim Coombs. Um, and, and personally, I know I'm so grateful that Tim Coombs is an advisor to the Center for Crisis and Risk Communications. We were, we were just together with Tim Coombs down in the state of Connecticut doing some uh, training with the, with the state. Uh, and it was just so... It was a career humbling moment to be standing next to Tim Coombs doing training. Um, one of those mind blowing things. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so while I encourage everybody to pick up this book again, look for the link. Uh, I have a, I have a chapter in it and so does Joe, Joe's chapter right here. So Joe, your chapter, which I, which I was really struck by the title. Because this fits right into the to the experience I have working with Dr. Vincent Cavello, working with Dr. Timothy Coombs, in really understanding that effective crisis communications is a science-based discipline. There is science that supports theories, tools, approaches in trying to be as effective as we can be with our communications in high-stress, high-concern situation environments. The title of your chapter, Joe, how can crisis communication, how can crisis communications become an evidence based practice? Mm -hmm. And what I love about that title is I often get asked this question. How do I get buy in from the executive? How do I get buy in from the leadership? How do I get support from the leadership team? And to me, that connects with here it is. We've got evidence that supports why this is important. So for me, Joe, I'd love to dive in a little bit with your top three things about how and why crisis communications needs to be or is an evidence-based practice. Yes, so three things. Um... Start, start with number one, your big, one. this well, is it, baby. The number one insight is that evidence-based management is the only way forward for uh, crisis communications practitioners and any other communication practitioners, right? So what does evidence-based management mean? It does not mean that you should only make use of scientific sources, but it does mean that you should fold them in, right? So I don't want people to think that their personal experiences or institutional knowledge that exist in an organization or stakeholder concerns that they do not count. I just mentioned actually three sources and these three sources together with academic knowledge or the contain the make up the four pillars of evidence based management. So there's more than just the scientific reports, the scientific articles, the scientific insights, but the scientific insights do count, right? Um, and um, and it's often the most difficult part of the equation, right? 
defining that institutional knowledge, those con uh, consulting those stakeholders, that takes a lot of work, but conceptually that's doable and pretty easy to manage for most practitioners. But then the science, right? That that is sometimes a, that a, ta a taller order, um, and that's a pity because, um, as you just mentioned, th th this, there's no need for us to guess about a lot of things anymore, right? Should you be speaking with a slow pitch or a, a, a fast a fast pitch? Uh, uh, um, how should you structure your messaging, right? Should you should you say no comment ever in a crisis? And um, and is that problematic? And for which reason? Should you talk in vivid language or not, in or outside of a crisis, etc., etc., etc.? It has been researched, right? We don't need to make this up, right? This there is information available that can help us practitioners be effective, be credible, and. Um, and it helps us also, you know, back up our recommendations, right? We we don't we're, we're, we don't need to tell the executive committee this is what needs to be done because we say so. This is what needs to be done because the facts, the, the science says that research shows that, right? Um, I love that connection there, Joe. Yeah, you, you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it on assumptions. That evidence base says I. I got this because I know. I got yes. this because it's been studied and we and we know. Yes, when you have a fever, you go to a doctor, right? That doctor takes care of you. That doctor is not following a gut feeling, examining you and prescribing medication. That doctor is basing his or her assessment and prescriptions and treatment on what the science says about what is happening to you, right? There is no reason why the same approach could not be applied to crisis communications. I see no conceptual reason why these things would be different, right? So let's let's be doctors in our own right, right? And and apply scientific insights where possible. Second insight um, is that um, is it always easy then to find the scientific insights? And, and and find your your um, the forest through the trees no but what is difficult or challenging at times doesn't mean does is not necessarily impossible right so there are tools available there is help available nobody's telling practitioners that they should get a subscription on 20 academic journals right and flow to all these journals themselves, right? Uh, and, and, and that they are just left with having to digest all these primary sources. If you're passionate about academic articles, by all means, have fun, right? Take a deep dive and have, and, and have all the, have fun. But there are sources available. There are books that are being published that translate these insights, that summarize, that summarize them, that curate them. Uh, the Institute for Public Relations, it's one source among others. The person who is hosting this um, conversation runs his own organization, which is a resource for these kinds of ins uh, um, insights, because what you are doing at your end is translating a lot of the knowledge from Dr. Covello into actionable insights, right? So there are sources available that aggregate, that curate, and that um, and that, that many times, you, you know, um, practitioners can consult at no cost or at very minimal cost. So not having access is not really an excuse, right? Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be intimidated like, oh, the science, where to start, right? No, nobody, you don't need to get lost in, you know, just go to these sources that curate, that aggregate, and you'll be just fine. Right. Well, well thank, thanks for the plug there, Joe. Um, <laughs> we we are a big fan of the research and the and the life work of Vincent Cavello. Yeah. And, and clearly, obviously, also a fan of the life work and the research of Timothy Coombs. Um, so, is there is there a is there a to go to place that you have? You know, like is there a is there a check this out because this is where 
this is where you're going to find the best or the most is there is there something that you have in your no, back pocket or it's a combination of things it's um it's a combination of sources that 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 i consult um it can be books um from from scholars but books then that are not written for scholars but for practitioners right first and foremost um it could be webinars could be articles on content on sites just like yours or on institute institutes for public relations um it could be maybe some IEBC or PRSA content. There's a lot out there. Everybody can make for themselves a list with like five, six, seven of these sources that are worth um, a regular visit. What, yes. So whatever resonates for you and whatever connects to you as a practitioner. And, oh, yes, and you're gonna you're gonna consume content in the in in um, in in whatever shape and form that works best for you also huh some people love podcasts i'm not really good with audio because my mind starts wandering off and mm. i can concentrate on audio sources that's probably my personal <laughs> attention <laughs> deficit problem um but but reading textual information i can process easily and, and quickly everybody just needs to find whatever works for them yeah absolutely and, and i love that you brought up books um shameless plug again if you're interested in crisis communications as a profession as a hobby as an interest you gotta check out tim coombs sherry holiday uh the handbook of crisis communications the other to go to for me which i think is just brilliant is communicating in risk crisis and high stress situations by dr vincent cavello this book is this book is a powerhouse this book is uh a 40 year career of one of the world's, arguably, one of the world's uh, most profound crisis and risk communications practitioners, researchers, consultants and professors, Dr. Vincent Cavello. That's another yeah, risk one. communication is also a field in which there is already a lot of empirical uh, research has been done already in that field, huh? Right? Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's so I think we've got two there, Joe. Got two. Oh yes, you're yeah. not okay. I'm still on the hook for a third one. Well, a third one is uh, implementation, of course, right? So if you, once you have read up and 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 conducted, you know, done some study work um, as as a professional, um, nothing is gained if you're not going to implement insights. An implementation can happen. So an implementation means. Um, uh, having those insights permeate into the deliverables and in, into how you counsel your client huh just to give an example huh? because i don't want this to sound too abstract um uh, as a crisis uh, comes professionals we will often um, uh, design or at, or at least advise clients on what their crisis communications manual should look like well the crisis communications manual can be designed in an evidence based manner right there can be processes in place in that ma in, in that manual that makes sense you know that that accommodate how the human brain works just to give one example one of the emerging fields in crisis communications which coincidentally because i don't want to turn this into the the big timothy coom show necessarily there's other academics as well right um but coincidentally this is one because he picks fields that are interesting so one of the fields he has shown an interest in and written about is cognitive biases right um heuristic biases sorry heuristic biases so biases that make that communicators uh, make less than optimal choices in a crisis. For example, they will be trained, they will know all about um, uh, different, you know, communicate, they will have trained, be trained in situational crisis communi communication theory. Cognitively, they will at one time in their career have processed the advantages and disadvantages of many theories and many approaches. And then a crisis erupts, they're under a lot of pressure, they're tired, there's cognitive narrowing, and they forget almost all of it, right? Um, so there's a, a few biases here that, that come into play. Um, what a communicator can then do, right, is provide for checklists 
in the manual. Checklists that force, that prompt communicators to weigh all the potential consequences of the communication options they are considering. And it will bring those back into mind, back into attention, back into their field of attention during a crisis where sometimes fatigue and stress might have them forget about certain things. So that is a very straightforward and, and a pretty easy, but very useful and very valuable example of how um, an evidence-based management technique, because checklists are known to be useful debiasing technique, right? How evidence-based management can make for some a few simple measures that will improve the work I, I I like that I like that a lot, and I and I think to your point, it it's often it's it's a it's an important piece. It's often overlooked. Yes, and that's when we're talking about the communication staff and all of the responders and all of the people that are doing the operational work. But if we just look at the the uh, communication staff, we talk about and we preach the importance of adjusting your communication approach when you're trying to be as effective as you can communicating with audiences who are in a situation where they're feeling stressed and concerned. And we know, speaking of evidence-based, we know that when people are feeling stressed or concerned, the rules of communication change. The rules of communication change because the way in which the brain processes information when one is feeling stressed or concerned changes as well. So if the brain is communicators are yes, communicators are human. They are yeah. human. yes. And so we we always we talk about changing our approach to land with our audience, but we often forget about that communicator also feeling under stress and feeling concerned and having to perform in a high stress, high concern environment themselves. So Ray, it's we all think, oh, they got it, they got it. But, you know, uh, some of the events I've been involved in, it's super stressful. And, you know, in, in some cases, you've got life on the line and you've got, you know, people's um, livelihoods on the line and you've got health and mental health on the line. Yes. And, yes. and so if we're not taking care of ourselves or supporting the communication staff through a variety of things. And to your point, give them a checklist so that it's just something they can reference to say, oh shit, I forgot about that or oops, or mm, yeah, I did think of that, but not applicable in this situation. Yeah, yeah. another example, just a second example that comes to mind, uh, which is also an example of, of, of um, a context in which uh, insights can easily be applied, in my opinion, is media trainings. Huh? Uh, a media tra in, in a media training for people who are also going to be prepared for a crisis, to communicate in a crisis. There are certain things of which we know, they have been researched, of which we know that they should be special attention points for anybody who's going to deliver messages in a crisis. Right? Just to give an example, vividness of messages, messages, messages that are vivid, sometimes risk in a crisis to exacerbate the, the perception of the severity of a crisis, right? Also, the whole keep smiling approach. A smile can be very, you know, amicable, right? Amenable can 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 can, can be useful right? uh, in 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 in, uh, in uh, when, when you're giving an interview. Clearly, you need to be careful with that smile when you're communicating bad news in a crisis, right? So I'm not making any of this up. This is, has all been researched. This is all empirically validated. So this also, so media trainings are also um, a, a, a deliverable par excellence where evidence-based management can come in with insights and make um, for and, and improve the content of the training and, and, and improve the skills of the trainee considerably. And I also might know somebody perhaps in this in the Texas area that does media training that is evidence-based um, and his name might be Joe so oh, yeah, if, well, you, heard about this. if you're in the text if you're in the US or yeah. anywhere in the world and you're looking for that evidence-based media training yeah. look up look up Joe de Tavernier, um and teaser maybe keep an eye out for a offering coming and a collaboration between Joe 
the Tavernier and 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 this guy, because um, we are both of the mindset that collaboration, working together, uh, fostering relationships, just all point to greatness together. And uh, so, just a teaser. Watch for something coming um, from from Joe and Ben. So, Joe, just re recapture those for us. Your top three, just the headline title. Three things crisis communications folks should think about when talking about evidence-based crisis comms. One, evidence-based uh, management is something you cannot go without in crisis comms. Two, yes, there is a way for busy practitioners to find their way to the scientific insights they need to do their job well. It is possible, it is feasible, it doesn't need to be expensive, and it doesn't need to take a huge amount of time. Three, implementation is key. And also here, it's not that difficult, it's not that complex to, but it is necessary, right, to translate insights into the, how we counsel clients and our deliverables. Voila, those are my three points. And without the execution, what's the point? So I love that I love that you brought that back. Do you That's all the work? Yes, we are practitioners. I am a consultant. We are not academics, right? Yes. So with with all of that knowledge, unless you're applying it, what's the point, really? So implement it, deliver it. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Joe a de Tavernier, a contributing author, to the Dr. Timothy Coombs, Dr. Sherry Holiday text called The Handbook for Crisis Communications. Um, fun fact, it's available on Amazon. Uh, go pick it up. What a great read. Um, this is The Handbook for Crisis Communications, authored by arguably one of the world leading uh, current professors, academic researchers in this space, Dr. Timothy Coombs, who was both a friend of myself and Joe. So Joe, thanks again for the chat today. Welcome. That's and, my pleasure. Uh, Look forward to our next uh, our next collaboration. Likewise.